Now, it's been quite a year indeed, and there's still more in 2013 to come. Mark your calendars, if you will, for the post-Thanksgiving period, uh, after your nap, when we will host our last speaker on December 5th. And in fact, if you come out, you'll have an opportunity to cheer for the home team, uh, because we'll be enjoying a lecture by SMU's own Ed Countryman. Ed, wave your hand. There he goes, right there. Uh, so if you want a preview, you can assault him beforehand. Uh, he'll be speaking on the topic of George Washington and the problem of slavery. Uh, no small topic indeed, so please come out for that one. It should be, de it'll be December 5th. Now, needless to say, presidential history, of course, has been much in the news in Dallas this last week, as the world, of course, turns its attention to recalling the tragic events that occurred here a full half century ago. And I think it's fair to say that this is a week in which we all take time to reflect not only on the events of November 1963, but also what those events have, of course, come to mean to all of us in our own lives and in the course of our nation. I think it's fair to say that the world turned that day and changed and would never be the same again after. And the world turned again in a similar epic way 12 years ago on a single day on a day that President George W. Bush would later famously call a day of fire. September 11th, of course, changed us all, and it surely changed the course of the nation, and as we will hear tonight, it also, of course, changed the course of the Bush presidency for the ensuing nearly eight years. We are here tonight to discuss that presidency and the vice presidency that came with it with a man who is, frankly, so well known on the national scene as a writer and a journalist that I think it's fair to say he needs no introduction, but I will give him one anyway, because Peter Baker is not merely a journalist with 20 plus years of reporting under his belt. He's not merely the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times, and he is not just a man who has studied up close and personal four different presidents, by which I mean Presidents Clinton, Bush, Obama, and Vladimir Putin. Baker is also a writer who epitomizes the old phrase that journalism is the first slice of history. What he has given us with his new book, the book of course he's here to discuss tonight, Days of Fire, is to my mind not only the first slice of history, but more importantly it's a foundation I think for future studies of the Bush White House. Every subsequent historian who comes to terms and tries to come to terms with this administration will first have to come to terms with this book. And we don't have to wait that long, we get to hear about it tonight. So if you will please join me in welcoming to the stage, Peter Baker. Well, of course, gosh, thank you all for coming here. I really appreciate it. I, I, uh, uh, when I talked to Jeff about coming down to Dallas to talk about a president in late November, <laughs> it didn't occur to me that I'd be talking about the wrong president. <laughs> But in fact, I think this is kind of a nice little bit of counter-programming, right? In a week when you've probably had your fill of JFK, we can talk about GWB. So uh, it'll be a fun evening, I hope. Um, I'm going to talk for a little bit and open it up to questions, because I think actually a conversation is a more way, uh, engaging and fun way of, of, of doing this. Uh, but this is a, a, a particularly uh, um, uh, honor, big honor for me and a big treat for me to be here at the center. I didn't realize it was the one-year anniversary of, of coming to the public that it makes it a particular uh, treat for me. I, I'm a, a big admirer of everything that you all are doing here uh, to build this center and to build a, a place of learning about the presidency in our country's history. We tell our stories often through the lens of our, of our leaders and uh, this place uh, therefore will be an invaluable addition to uh, our study of presidents uh, throughout our history and I'm, I'm really very glad to be here. Very glad also to be at the place that hosts the, uh, the George W. Bush Presidential Library Museum. Um, I've spent a little bit of time over there uh, both visiting when they were getting construction and coming for the, uh, the opening in the spring and, and, and I've got, had a, uh, the honor of meeting a number of the people there and I believe that uh, we will all be spending a lot of time there in the years to come studying and, and, and learning more about uh, what I think has to be one of the most, if not the, certainly the, one of the most consequential presidencies in modern times. So um, it's, it's great to be here. I'm, I have to admit I'm a little intimidated tonight. 
a little intimidated. I've given this talk a few dozen times at this point, but never to an audience where I'm pretty sure everybody here must know who I'm talking about. <laughs> So I'm going to start this way, which I've never done before in any ways. I'm going to ask for a show of hands of anybody here who actually has met either President Bush or Vice President Cheney. Yeah, see, I don't get this in Berkeley. <laughs> That's great. Okay, good. That's great. And I want to have a, a subsequent show of hands. How many people here actually worked at some point or another for either President Bush or Vice President Cheney? Okay. All right. Good. All right. Uh, so there's no rebuttal. Okay. <laughs> Good. Now, I'm, um, I'm very uh, uh, glad to talk to an audience that then knows the, uh, the subject so well, knows my, my protagonist so well for this book. Uh, I, this book, Days of Fire, uh, attempts to be the first full-scale independent history of the eight years of the Bush-Cheney White House. Uh, and as, and as, as we were just hearing, it takes its name from President Bush's second-term inaugural address when he refers to 9-11 uh, as a day of fire. Uh, and in effect, the conceit of the title is that this was eight years of days of fire. So many crises that, that confronted uh, these two leaders, uh, war, terrorism, natural disaster, financial collapse, lots of things in between that, uh, you know, as daunting as any modern president has ever confronted. Uh, and it's a presidency that redefined America for the post-Cold War uh, era, for good or ill, and one that has lasting consequences uh, to, that we still see today in the vexing issues that we're debating every day in Washington and in, in the newspapers you're reading uh, in, in the morning and the TV broadcasts that you, that you watch at night. Uh, think about the, 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 the issues just in the last few months alone. President Obama had to decide what to do about the use of chemical weapons in the Middle East, right? What is the right response by the United States? Do we take military action? Uh, uh, the leader of Libya's al-Qaeda was snatched off the streets of Tripoli, and they had to decide, what do we do with him? Do, where do we send him? What is a proper uh, process for a captured terrorist at this point? Uh, the issues that we're seeing about surveillance every day have their roots, of course, in the last administration. Uh, even issues of health care and the economy uh, have parallels or, 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 or antecedents uh, in the previous presidency. You hear people talk about President Obama's fifth year troubles, and the, a lot of them are making the comparison to President Bush's fifth year trouble. Is the health care problem the same as Katrina? You know, what, is the, what are the parallels? What lessons do we learn from the last administration that might be of use in interpreting and in anticipating what's happening in this administration? So it's because of that that I wanted to do this book. The last administration has such consequence, such meaning uh, for all of us today that without a, without a uh, what I hope is a neutral exploration of what happened, a re-examination of the, of, the, of the facts, trying to take people inside the room, uh, we wouldn't be able to understand it as, as fully as we probably ought to. And I've, and I've discovered, having covered now three White Houses uh, for the Washington Post and the New York Times, I think that we kind of get reporters maybe 20% of what's going on at any given time. You know, I think we get essential truths. I think we know broad strokes about what's happening. But in the end, there's so much more happening behind the closed doors that we don't know about. And it's only after the fact, when we go back to re-explore and re-examine and interview people after the consequences are over, after uh, the headlines are passed, that we get a fuller, better understanding. We peel back the layers. And in peeling back the layers of this administration, I interviewed 275 people, total of 400 interviews. A number of people gave me documents that had never been released before, notes and so on. I read. Uh, all the memoirs, I think, that are out there. There are more memoirs out of this administration, I think, than any in history, not just the president, as you would expect, and the vice president, and the first lady, and the secretary of state, not just the chief speechwriter. Two deputy chief speechwriters wrote memoirs. The deputy director of faith-based services wrote a memoir. The domestic policy advisor to the vice president wrote a memoir. The guy who did the deal that put Karzai into office in Afghanistan did a memoir. The guy who did the deal that got Gaddafi to give up his weapons did a memoir. The guy who went to Iraq to look for the weapons couldn't find them did a memoir. The guy who published all the memoirs is probably doing a memoir right now. <laughs> so that's also an archive, in effect, of information and a perspective that is, is useful to mine because, in fact, nobody could read all of them. I read them so you don't have to. And we find, in fact, uh, that in pulling together all of this information, we, 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 if we don't get to 100%, we may take our 20% to 30, 40, maybe 50% for now until the archives open up in, the f in future years and we get a better, uh, fuller uh, access to the papers and what will be really interesting, the emails uh, of this administration. 
So out of all this research, for me, came, I think, a more nuanced and surprising understanding of an administration widely depicted in cartoonish strokes, uh, black and white, uh, stick figures. And central to that was a partnership between these two men, George W. Bush and Dick Cheney, which was unlike that of any president or vice president in history. Probably no two Americans in public office have collaborated to greater effect in modern times since Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger. And yet what I discovered was the common caricature that we had, that you know, Cheney was the power behind the throne, the puppet master, and so forth, missed the fundamental and ultimately much more interesting story of their tandem, the evolution from a collaboration that was in fact unique to uh, a, a, a very dramatic divergence over the eight years they were in office to the, to the end of their time together when they were on opposite sides of most of the major issues that were confronting them. Now, looking at these two protagonists, uh, you have to go back and understand biography, right? Who are these two men? Where do they come from? And they seem so different, right? Bush, of course, is, is gregarious and outgoing and, you know, uh, even goofy in his humor, likes people, uh, you know, unafraid to, to be self-deprecating. You, you might have seen him on Jay Leno the other night. He was joking about the paintings, right? He says, somewhere in here there's a Rembrandt locked inside this body, right? He was asked why he had named the stray cat he found on the ranch Bob. He said, so I can remember how to spell it later on. <laughs> he's a very, you know, he's the guy you wanted to have a beer with. That was always the, the, the take that people had when he was running for office. Cheney, by comparison, is more stoic, more reserved, harder to get to know, very, very tight, closed to some extent, uh, more seasoned, more experienced than, than Bush was. Uh, by the time uh, Bush uh, had reached uh, the t office of governor of Texas, Cheney had already been White House chief of staff, uh, congressman for 10 years, member of the Intelligence Committee, and the Secretary of Defense. But there actually are some similarities between their backgrounds that I found interesting. For one thing, how far apart do you think they are in age? I make money asking this question and getting get people to guess. They're not as far apart as you think. They're only five years apart in age, right? I think people have the impression of Cheney being an older fellow, a more, you know, a, you know, a father figure to some extent, a more gravitas, and he obviously did have that seasoning that Bush didn't have in 2000 when the two of them teamed up. But they're not that far apart. And they grew up in circumstances that weren't actually quite as different as you think. Now, obviously, Bush comes from privilege, a family with great connections through history, you know, they were, his grandparents and parents were the friends of the Rockefellers and the Harrimans and the Kennedys, and they, they've traveled in all these circles, no question. His grandfather was a senator, his father obviously later became president. But when he grew up in Midland, uh, I went and visited, it's a small house, several small houses they, that they, they went to, because in fact, the, the family was under, under the expectation that you made your own money. You couldn't just uh, take dad's money, and so George H.W. Bush goes off to Texas branching out on his own to try to make his own way in the world. And they lived in rather modest circumstances growing up for a while. And Bush's upbringing you know, is, 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 is less of the privileged Kenny Bunkport variety than we think of, and more of the Midland uh, homestead. Their first home, in fact, in Texas, I think, was in Odessa, uh, which was a, 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 a joint two duplex, I guess, kind of house in which the other people apparently were a mother and daughter prostitution uh, pairing. So. <laughs> This is not, you know, the sort of New England privilege we think about. This is a different kind of upbringing. Similarly, Cheney, not similarly exactly, but Cheney also grew up in the West. He grew up in, in Wyoming. They, they both were in these, these, young, uh, these young frontier oil towns. Midland and Casper, Wyoming were, were boom towns in those days. Uh, and like, uh, Bo like President Bush uh, had sort of a frontier mentality about uh, his upbringing, uh, you know, his friends describe it as sort of a happy days, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, Mayberry kind of upbringing. Both of the men go off to college at Yale, the same college. Both of them don't like it. Both of them don't do all that well there. Uh, Bush survives and with his gentleman C, as he, as he puts it. Cheney actually flunks out. Both of them walk away from Yale with the same kind of bristling resentment of what they saw as East Coast elitism, anti, and, 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 and intellectualism and, and, uh, that informs their politics going forward. Both of them were uh, troublemakers as young men. They had their um, uh, a robust uh, youth, to say the least. Uh, Cheney used to call beer life's essential, and he had a lot of life's essential. Both of them had run-ins with the law. Both of them had uh, you know, been arrested uh, for, for, for being intoxicated in public. Both of them finally got their acts together when the women in their lives put their foot down. Uh, so there's, there's more similarity there than we think of. 
Uh, and so by the time they get together, uh, they form an unusual pairing. Now, people think Cheney got his way uh, onto the ticket by heading the selection committee, and that's certainly true. He was uh, head of the selection committee, and that's, uh, he once told his high school uh, 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 in Wyoming uh, as a commencement address, he said to the young people, I have one piece of advice for you. If you're ever asked to head up a search committee, say yes. <laughs> and, uh, but in fact, Bush had Cheney on his mind years earlier. Uh, as early as 1992, he told his father that he thought he should get rid of Dan Quayle for the re-election ticket and put his defense secretary on the ticket, Dick Cheney. Obviously, his father didn't do that, but the idea clearly stuck because 2000 comes around and Governor, then, Governor Bush wins the primaries. And he sends Joe Alba, his aide here from Texas, to go vi visit uh, Cheney here in Dallas where he's president of Halliburton. And he asks him to be vice president. And Cheney says no. And it's only at that point that he becomes head of the selection committee uh, vetting the other candidates. And something happens, obviously, between these two moments in which Cheney changes his mind, Bush's, uh, Bush also uh, uh, prevails upon him. Uh, and there are those who believe to this day, including some friends of Cheney, that he manipulated the process to make sure that all the others possible candidates look weak. Uh, but clearly Bush was, was inclined in that direction uh, even from the start. He, had, he once said that he liked, um, he knew he liked Cheney when Cheney said that he had taken one of these career tests, right? What's your ideal career with his personality tests? And Cheney told him that his ideal career apparently was funeral director. <laughs> Bush liked that. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so they, they, they come together in 2000 and they put together what uh, uh, becomes a, an unusual working relationship. Uh, Bush uh, agrees to make uh, Cheney a vice president unlike any before. Now, Cheney uh, knew how bad the job could be. In fact, in an interview with me, he said, being vice president is a cruddy job. Uh, and he knew because he had helped force Nelson Rockefeller out of the job and off the ticket in 1976. He had boxed Dan Quayle out of some of the chain of the command uh, moments in the Bush 41 presidency, uh, and he understood that, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that go with the job that aren't very good, and Bush, uh, W. Bush says, no, we're gonna have a different understanding. Uh, he gives him access to every decision in every meeting he wants to be a part of. So Harry Truman had two meetings with Roosevelt when he was vice president. Cheney was asked in 2002 how many meetings he had had with Bush, and he pulls out his daily count, and he said, let me count here, see, Three, four, five, six, seven, seven times, he says, and then he pauses for effect today. <laughs> and he uses that access to great effect, obviously. Uh, and Bush was happy to have him there. Bush gives him this authority. He empowers him to put together the administration to, during the transition and the recount. He, Cheney uses the opportunity to sprinkle his people that he knows uh, around various places in the administration. Cheney understands how power works. He understands how Washington works. And Bush relies on him in a way that previous vice presidents haven't been relied on. Now, that's not saying too much because the history of vice presidency is a pretty sorry one, right? I mean, you know, uh, uh, Adams, John Adams I said that, you know, it was the most significant, insignificant job ever invented by man. Uh, Jack Garner, FDR's vice president, famously said it wasn't worth a warm bucket, a bu bucket of warm, uh, well, spit, we say today. You know, that's how we clean that up. Um, it wasn't until Walter Mondale that we even let the vice president in the White House. Uh, they didn't even have an office in the West Wing until Mondale came along. So uh, Cheney's, Cheney's uh, relationship to Bush was unusual. And part of that is because his power derived from actually subordinating himself to Bush. Uh, rather than, in fact, being the dominating presence in meetings, Cheney was actually very quiet. Bush was the one who ran them. As Dick Myers, the general who ran the Joint Chiefs of Staff later, put it to me in an interview, he says it was no, no question who the alpha male in the White House was, and that was Bush. And instead, uh, Cheney wouldn't say anything less called on, and people would walk out of the meeting scratching their heads, trying to figure out where he stood, but then they noticed that when they left the meetings, he stayed behind, and it was just the two of them, just Bush and Cheney, and that was how he, how he exercised his influence. And the difference was that he didn't want to be president. Every other vice president in modern times, really going back to Charles Dawes, I think, in 1924, comes into office wanting to be president. And that creates an inherent friction between president and vice president. Think of President Clinton and Gore, uh, Vice President Gore, very similarly situated men of the South, both ambitious, 
uh, strong ideas, strong wills, and there's a grinding like tectonic plates under the surface in California just kind of naturally because of these competing desires and ambitions. That wasn't the case in this case. Bush did not perceive Cheney as a rival. Cheney was not a rival, and therefore he granted him extraordinary uh, influence. One month into the administration, February 2001, Bush learns that the American military is bombing Iraq for the first time in his presidency. It's a no-fly zone violation, and he's, for the first time, as a commander-in-chief in charge, and the one thing he says is, I'm going to call Dick. Condi Rice, who was with him that day, told me she was really struck by how much the president was leaning on his vice president at that point. Likewise, in March 2003, when they're getting ready to go into Iraq uh, full-scale uh, with an invasion, George Tenet Donald Rumsfeld show up at the Oval Office and they say there's some intelligence showing we, where we think Saddam Hussein is. Do we want to launch an early strike to try to get him? Bush meets with his staff. They all talk about what to do. And then he kicks them all out, except for Cheney. The one person he wants to talk to alone, just the two of them, is Dick Cheney. And he comes out of that meeting and says, go. And that's the beginning of the Iraq War. But all of that, I think, because of that, people have gotten the misimpression about what that means and what that meant Cheney represented in that administration. It also underestimates Bush, right? He may not have been uh, 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 an SMU PhD, uh, but he's a really smart guy, much more so than people give him credit for, and a graduate of two Ivy League schools in Andover. Um, and he, and he, you know, he knew his own mind. Um, to the extent that Cheney won these early fights, it's because he was pushing on an open door. He understood how to work the process. He understood how to, to, to get his way. But if Bush didn't agree with him, he wouldn't, have, uh, he wouldn't have gone that direction. I asked all these 275 people, or at least mostly 275 people I interviewed, did Bush ever tell you that Cheney convinced him to do something he didn't want to do? And as far as I can tell, Bush has never said that to anybody. There are even times in the beginning, at the height of Cheney's influence, that Bush says no. Cheney comes to him with Rumsfeld in summer of 2002 and says, let's go ahead and have a strike against northern Iraq. We think there's a chemical weapons facility there being run by a man named Ayman al-Zarqawi, who later, of course, becomes quite infamous as the head of al-Qaeda in Iraq, a very, uh, uh, very uh, deadly enemy for Americans and Iraqis alike. But Bush says, no, he doesn't want to rush into this. He has, he has a plan for how to confront Iraq and, and, and launching a war in summer of 2002, eight months or so before he actually does, uh, is too soon as far as he's concerned. He tells Cheney no. Cheney doesn't want him to go to the UN. Bush decides to go to the UN anyway. anyway. Cheney doesn't want him to ask the UN to send inspectors back in. Bush wants to do that anyway. So the, even in the early days, at the maximum height of Cheney's power, Bush, on any number of occasions, uh, says no. And as you explore the presidency uh, that develops and develops and, and, and evolves, what you see is Bush begins to turn much more dramatically away from Cheney as time moves on. Uh, obviously, the war in Iraq goes badly. There aren't the weapons that uh, Bush and Cheney had told us were there or that they had been told were there. The violence is worse than they had expected. And Bush is eager to, to, to find ways to reorient his administration. He elevates Condoleezza Rice to Secretary of State, effectively putting her at a peer level with uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld. And he uses her to begin to make a pivot more toward diplomacy, more compromises on some of the controversial terrorism programs that uh, caused such disputes in the first term. That's not to say Cheney was entirely on the margins in the second term, but he was on defense much more than he was on offense, trying to fend off changes that he thought would weaken the country or unravel the policies that he and Bush had put in place that he thought were so important. So by the time that they left office, Bush and Cheney were, were on the opposite sides of, of most of the major issues that they were confronting. They were on the opposite sides of North Korea, Syria, Iran, Lebanon, Russia, uh, climate change, gay rights, gun rights, the auto bailout, Harriet Myers, Donald Rumsfeld, federal spending, Middle East peace, and then, of course, at the end, uh, the, whether to have a pardon for Scooter Libby. I think a particularly telling moment of the evolution of their partnership comes in 2007. Now, the Israelis have come to Washington and said, we have intelligence showing that the Syrians have a nuclear facility that the North Koreans helped them build. We think it's part of a secret plot for nuclear weapons. We think you should bomb it. President Bush gathers his team together, much like he did before going into Iraq. He asks them what they think. 
And this time, though, rather than kicking everybody else out to have, have uh, a one-on-one with Cheney, he asked the vice president in front of everybody else, what do you think we should do? And the vice president says, I think we should bomb them. We've set red lines before when it comes to proliferation. We should ab- abide by those. We should stick by what we said because that is important to our credibility to do that. The president says, okay, who else agrees with the vice president? And no hands go up. So now here we are four years later in which the vice president has been isolated from the rest of the team and then forced to confront his isolation in front of the team instead of the one-on-ones that he used to, to enjoy. All of this comes to a head in the final and frantic days of the administration. Now, as if they didn't have enough on their plates with the economic troubles and the auto uh, collapse, the Bush and Cheney find their last stretch in office dominated by this quiet but fiercely intense struggle over what to do with Scooter Libby. Now, Libby, of course, was the vice president's chief of staff and national security advisor, super important to the vice president, his, his right-hand man, Cheney's Cheney, people called him. And he had been convicted in the CIA leak case, not of the leak itself, but of perjury and obstruction of justice for, and, uh, according to the prosecutors, not telling the truth about how he had learned about Valerie Plame's association with the CIA. Bush commuted the sentence. He was given a two and a half year sentence. Bush thought that was extreme. Uh, but he didn't get rid of the uh, verdict itself. Cheney comes back to him at the end of the administration and says, now that you're leaving off, it's time to think about this as a pardon. His father had done it with some controversial pardons at the end of his administration. Clinton had done it at the end of his administration with some controversial pardons. Cheney thought that Bush could live with the controversy to do what he thought was right and, uh, and remove what he thought was a stain uh, from an honorable man who had been caught up in what Cheney thought was a bogus political prosecution. Bush was skeptical, though. Bush didn't much like pardons to begin with. He thought the process was kind of skewed, that the people who had special access were able to get special favors, and he didn't like the whole thing. And here was the person with the ultimate special access asking for the ultimate special favor. So he sent out a couple of the White House lawyers to go back and look at the case again. And they reexamined it. They went through the trial transcripts. They met with Scooter Libby at a seafood restaurant near the White House. And they came back to the president. They said, well... We think the jury had ample reason to convict. They, they made a, a rational decision here. Uh, and in fact, during a key meeting in the Oval Office, Bush told the lawyers he believed Libby had not told the truth to investigators because he thought he was, quote, protecting Cheney. So Bush decides not to grant the pardon. And Cheney snaps at him as, in a way that he had never done before in eight years. He says, you're leaving a good man wounded on the field of battle. After all their differences in the last few years of the administration, Cheney was essentially asking for one last validation of their extraordinary partnership, and Bush refused to give it. Now, Bush was so bothered by this astringent encounter that he was just dwelling on it. He spends his last weekend up at Camp David. He's with family and friends. He's getting ready to finally leave. It's been an exhausting, extraordinary run for him. It's so much so, I mean, so many things that happened, so many days of fire that, in fact, a couple weeks earlier, he had had a ceremony at the White House. He gave a Medal of Freedom to... uh, the actor Morgan Freeman, he reminded the audience that Morgan Freeman had played a president himself in the movie Deep Impact. And the president, President Bush, says, you know, that's the one where the comet hits the planet and destroys civilization. And then he kind of adds in an ad lib. That's about the only thing that hadn't happened in the last eight years. <laughs> and he sits down and Condoleezza Rice li- leans over and whispers to him, there's two weeks left, don't jinx it. <laughs> so by this last weekend of the administration, he is exhausted. He is done. He is ready to go back to Texas. He wants nothing more to do with this. He's had it. Everything that could happen had happened on his watch. Some things of his own making, many things that weren't. But he's consumed by this fight with his vice president. He calls Dan Bartlett back here in Texas. Dan Bartlett was his close aide, had left the White House to return home. And he says, this sucks. I just can't stop thinking about it. Condi Rice, who's there at Camp David, pulls him aside, takes him into one of the other rooms, says, you've got to stop this. You, you can't make, let this be a pall over your last days in office. Laura Bush finally intervenes and says, you've got to make up your mind. You're ruining this for everyone. (laughs) But he can't. He can't stop thinking about it. So two days later come, it's the inauguration. He hasn't given the pardon to Scooter Libby. President-elect Obama shows up at the White House for the traditional White House coffee between the incoming and outgoing presidents. And then the two men get in the armored limousine to head to Capitol Hill for the swearing-in ceremony. It's just President Bush and President-elect Obama and the Secret Service literally the last minutes of Bush's presidency, and he offers his successor one piece of advice. He says, whatever you do, set a pardon policy early and stick to it. In other words, learn how to say no to your vice president from the beginning. On his mind, even as he's going out of office, all the things that he'd had to deal with, this is what's 
bothering him is, is this fight, this rift that he had had with his close partner of so many years. Of course, you know what happens then. They, the two separate. They both uh, geographically and metaphorically. Bush comes here home to Texas and resolves to stay silent. He says President Obama deserves his silence. He's so done with politics. He told at a dinner party uh, here in Dallas uh, after leaving office, he said, when I saw Obama hand go up that day, I thought to myself, free at last, free at last. <laughs> but Cheney was free at last too, right? He was no longer anyone's number two. He was no longer the subordinate. And he finally began speaking out, right? He became a very sharp and, and, and vocal critic of President Obama and his national security policies. He, he was upset that the Obama administration was going to reinvestigate the CIA officers who were involved in the interrogation program. Liz Cheney told me that uh, her father thought that was indefensible. But what was really interesting about that was it seemed like Cheney's public battle with Obama was kind of a proxy for his private battle with Bush. In effect, Obama had run against Bush's first term, but he inherited Bush's second term. And by that I mean that Bush had spent his second term shaving off the harshest edges of his program so that they would survive his presidency intact. Under pressure from the courts and Congress, he had gone to, to lawmakers and got buy-in from both parties on surveillance, on military commissions, on interrogation rules. There hadn't been any waterboarding after 2003. He, he emptied out the, the black site CIA prisons. He actually uh, removed more prisoners from Guantanamo uh, toward the idea of closing it than Obama has in the five years since. Uh, he, 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 he even signed a three-year withdrawal agreement with Iraq, paving the way to the end of the Iraq war that Obama ultimately executes. Uh, and so when Obama comes in, he doesn't feel the need, actually, to change that much. He adopts a lot of what he gets from Bush, even expands it in some cases, as we see with the drone program, as you see with the surveillance program. In effect, he kind of validates Bush's program. Any president who leaves something behind that is adopted by his successor, particularly a successor of the other party, has left a legacy that he can then claim. But Cheney's, of course, still upset at some of the changes that had been made. And in going after Obama, is voicing some of the frustrations that he had had in the final years of the Bush administration, but couldn't say out loud uh, from his undisclosed location uh, and his role as a number two in somebody else's administration. So what's the, what's the, where are they today? Uh, President Bush, as we see, is back here in Texas, and he's uh, opened up this fabulous new library uh, right here on the campus of SMU. It's, it's a, uh, uh, if you haven't visited, I recommend it. It's, it's, it's very, very interesting. Um, he, uh, his, his numbers have begun to go up a little bit. Uh, today, Gallup shows that the president's, uh, uh, the President Bush's uh, approval rating, I say actually that's favorability rating, is 49% versus 46% who find, uh, who are unfavorably viewed to him. Now, that's not a, necessarily a tremendous uh, ranking compared to, say, Kennedy, as we've been talking about these last few weeks. But uh, uh, for Bush, it's the first positive balance he's had in eight years, and, you know, higher than his successor is right now. So for Bush, it's not a bad time. Now, he's, I think he's benefited by his decision to um, remain quiet, to, to be gracious in retirement toward the, his successor. I think some conservatives who were alienated or disaffected from him have kind of feel better about him now because... His successor, in their view, is so terrible, right? I think Obama's troubles put Bush's troubles in perspective a little bit. This is not an easy job. The challenges are hard. The decisions aren't easy. The choices are few. And I think some, I think some liberals and moderates feel a little bit more fondly about President Bush because he's, uh, he stands in contrast to the Tea Party that they really don't like. Um, he favored immigration reform. He, uh, he uh, implemented the AIDS program that saved so many lives in Africa. Uh, he believed in a stronger federal role in education through No Child Behind, not abolishing the education department, as some would do. Uh, he uh, expanded Medicare to cover pharmaceutical drugs. So, in fact, he stands in, in contrast to the, to the Tea Party in some uh, respects, and particularly on foreign policy, where, where he and the Tea Party uh, diverge so strongly. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, President, Ob uh, President Bush's legacy, therefore, is to some extent still left to be written. Um, Iraq will always uh, be the central and first question, I think, along with 9-11. He is, uh, is this my uh, microphone? Um, okay, I got it. Uh, so uh, he, um, he will always be able to say that he protected the country 
after leaving uh, in, in a nine, on 9-12, that might not have seemed such an obvious thing, right, that we would get through the end of his presidency without another major attack. Uh, he has some domestic programs he can p point to as successes. Uh, he uh, will always claim, I think, that uh, Iraq and Afghanistan were good things because they liberated people from tyrannical governments. But of course, uh, the Iraq war will always be, you know, the big central dog in the room. Was it the right thing to go in? If it was the right thing to go in, should it have been handled better? How could it have been handled different? Why did it go so badly? Uh, what will be the end result in the Middle East? Uh, Iraq today doesn't look all that good. Uh, Afghanistan doesn't look all that good. Um, what will it look like 10 years from now? What will it look like 20 years from now? President Bush says his legacy won't be written until long after he's gone. He, he likes to joke that he reads new books all the time about George Washington, and if we're still debating the first George, then the 43rd guy is, uh, uh, doesn't have anything to worry about for a while. But I think that's why this book and, and books like it are going to be valuable, because I think they, they form a founding block to begin those discussions, which we're going to have in the years uh, and decades to come. So I think with that, let's just, just open up and have a conversation. You can ask anything you want. I, I'm totally open on Bush, Cheney, or book, or if you want to ask about Obama or journalism or anything but the Washington Redskins. Okay, great. Thank you. Did, I don't know if everybody heard the question. The question is uh, that President Bush, uh, in this view, got two major bum raps, uh, maybe more, but two that we're talking about here. One about whether he, uh, uh, he told the truth about intelligence, basically, in Iraq, the, the, bum that, the, the notion that Bush lied, right, and that he, uh, and that he mishandled Katrina. Um, I, think, I, think, uh, I think you make some good points. I think that, uh, I think that on the intelligence, I, in, in doing interviews, I found no evidence that Bush uh, didn't think there were weapons there. He thought there were weapons there. I, as far as I can tell, that he genuinely believed. Now, we can criticize, and with the benefit of hindsight, all the different ways that we can say today that there was confirmation bias. They saw what they wanted to see in the intelligence and, and didn't give enough weight to the contrary evidence or the dissents. But it's important to understand the environment in which they're operating. And I think the environment in which they're operating uh, is, in this post-9-11 moment, one that uh, uh, has created an atmosphere of, 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 of fear and uncertainty and anxiety about threats in the world, about the, a, a perilous world out there. And a friend of Bush, is a very close person to Bush, said, look, don't just think about the 9-11 uh, attacks. Think about anthrax. The anthrax attacks, in some ways, is more pivotal in, des in deciding what happens with Iraq because it's this... We didn't know at the time it was domestic. We thought it was a foreign-based attack. And here it was. We didn't know how we were, our country was going to be attacked. It could be attacked in all sorts of different ways, in ways that seemed scary and unpredictable and undefendable. And every day they were getting more and more reports like this. There was a botulinum scare in the White House where the president and the vice president were told they had been infected with a pathogen that would kill them. The Pakistani nuclear scientists were meeting with Osama bin Laden. Every day the threat reports they were getting listed every possible way bad guys are trying to kill Americans, and you, Mr. President, are responsible for stopping it. Now, the intelligence agencies, having failed to connect the dots prior to 9-11, is throwing everything they got at the White House, right? All kinds of stuff, raw, unfiltered, much of it fanciful, some of it real. So it creates an obvious atmosphere in which uh, the world looks very dangerous, and we're going to, we have to do what we have to do to make it a safer place, and, they're gonna, and, and they go out to slay dragons, as, as John Quincy Adams once uh, put it. And the biggest dragon they saw that they could uh, take on directly uh, was Saddam Hussein. So there's, I, I, think, uh, I think that uh, there's plenty to, to critique uh, in how it was handled, but I don't, I don't see any evidence. I haven't seen any evidence that suggests the president knew something that he did not 
say, that he knew what he said turned out not to be wrong. I think he was as surprised as anyone. On Katrina, I was actually with him on Air Force One the day he flew back and, and made the, the now famous flyover uh, over New Orleans. And um, I always kind of thought that was kind of a, uh, you know, at the time it made sense. I understood what the thinking was, right? He had three choices, either go back straight to Washington and not even look at the damage. He could try to land there, but get in the middle of all of the ongoing rescue efforts, which would have been very disruptive. You can't put Air Force One on the ground without a big commitment of resources. Or he could at least take a look on the way there. It seemed logical, but the picture was terrible. It was devastating. It gave the impression of being aloof and distant, and it hurt him. And he didn't go back as fast as he should have probably. He probably didn't recognize uh, 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 how bad the storm was. A lot of people didn't. Scott McClellan, who was his press secretary, said we all had grown a little complacent by that point because we had dealt with so many crises. We felt so confident that we knew how to do things, uh, and we didn't uh, do th uh, everything that we should have. Uh, there's the moment you're talking about, about whether to send in the National Guard, uh, and there is a dispute. The governor doesn't want it. The mayor does, by the way, for what it's worth, um, and, but Rumsfeld doesn't either. So he's fighting even within his own administration about whether to send in the National Guard, and today he says he made a mistake by, by, by not deciding to send them in several days earlier. Um, but, you know, this is, this is one of these things that, uh, that this book tries to deal with, and I think you get a fuller and three-dimensional picture by, uh, by, by reading it, if I can make that little pitch. <laughs> Sorry, we got a microphone here we for anybody. Mic, so please, uh, please use this whenever we've uh, got you. So I'll uh, pass it right back to you here. Well, this is for the benefit of our recording and everything, so... My question has to do with the weapons of mass destruction and the evidence of those weapons. And for me personally, a pivotal point was I believe it was Cheney who made a comment that, well, we can't prove it, uh, that they exist like you would in a court of law. Was that Cheney or was it Rumsfeld or was it Wolfowitz or who was it? That's a good question. I don't remember that particular quote, but that would certainly reflect his point of view, yes. I mean, he believed that, he, at one point he did say something like about nuclear terrorism. He said, if there's even a 1% chance, we have to act as if it's, it's, it's for real because the, the consequences are so devastating, right? What Cheney saw was not 19 guys with box cutters who did enormous damage, but a much more existential threat to the country. He had spent his career thinking about these things, bugs and gas, he liked to talk about chemical and biological weapons. In the 90s, sorry, in the 80s, uh, at, no, sorry, in, in, the, in, the, yeah, in the 80s, sorry, as a member of Congress, he had gone off every year to these continuity of government exercises. They spirited him off to play White House Chief of Staff in an apocalyptic scenario which nuclear war has just broken out, and he's left, among these others, to try to reconstruct a devastated country. So he has spent his life thinking about these kinds of things, and 9-11 comes together, and it's everything he's ever feared, right? So uh, to him, the world is filled with, with danger that needs to be confronted, and he sees intelligence and believes that the intelligence, if anything, is too cautious not to alarm us. And part of that is because after the 91 war, the intelligence guys come to him and say, look, we underestimated how far along Saddam Hussein is. Saddam Hussein was much closer to a nuclear program than we thought. And Cheney takes the lesson from that that you can't look at the intelligence and give it the benefit of the doubt. You have to get it the other way around. You have to assume the intelligence is only getting part of the story, not the other way around, not, not finding things that aren't there. Now, Obviously, that proves to be mistaken today. And we can find various points where they screwed up, right? Never believe a guy whose who's code name is Curveball, right? I mean, <laughs> that ought to tell us something, right? No, but the Germans, had, the Germans had presented him as a source and never let us interview him. Well, that should seem strange to us, right? And, it, and again, it wasn't just, as, as, as you said, it wasn't just the Republicans. It was the Democrats who believed us. And it wasn't just the Democrats. It was the Germans and the Italians and the French and the British. Everybody looked at this intelligence and came to roughly the same conclusions. Now, there was much more doubt about the nuclear stuff. That was always sketchier. And there was some doubt about the, uh, some of the biological stuff. There was some sketchy stuff in there. Everybody thought the chemical stuff more or less was true. So even the, except that some people didn't think that there were uh, weapons, they didn't think that there were certain types of weapons without necessarily questioning everything. So everybody gets caught up in this, uh, uh, in this mindset that there must be weapons because, after all, it is Saddam Hussein. He had them before, and he used them before, and it seemed logical. And it was what I think the scholars probably call confirmation bias. We saw what we expected to see. Okay. 
And by the way, press too, I would say, you know, we have our share of responsibility. So how did your view of Bush as president change from your going in position as White House correspondent to author, peeler back of layers, uh, hindsight looker? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. I think I didn't really understand quite uh, in detail um, uh, how involved he was in some of the events, and, and I think I had a better understanding of how he um, chose to govern and manage. Um, he had this idea that uh, 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 he had a Harvard, he was the first Harvard MBA to be president, right? The first, the MBA president. And he had this idea of delegation of authority. He believed in finding people you trusted, making sure they had what they needed, and then empowering them to do what they wanted to do, what they, what they should do. Um, but the problem for him was that he, he, he took the, he took the lesson from LBJ uh, that you shouldn't micromanage a war, but then for three years then allows Iraq to kind of slide into this terrible chaos without kind of asserting himself and saying, wait a second, our strategy isn't working. We need to stop and, and start again. He finally does that at the end of 2006. He finally breaks out of his own comfort zone as a leader to say, we need to, we need to rethink what we're doing here. And he makes a decision, a very bold decision, arguably one of the boldest, if not the boldest, presidential decision uh, in modern times to go against all popular opinion, against the Democrats in Congress, against the Republicans in Congress, against the Joint Chiefs, his commanders on the ground, his own Secretary of State, the Iraq Study Group with uh, Jim Baker, his father's Secretary of State, to send more troops to try to salvage this, uh, this uh, failing war. Um, and I think that that, uh, I think that watching that transition from sort of a hands-off, you know, do you have what you need, okay, good, go, point of view in 2003 to, wait a second, I'm going to now assert myself, and, and doing so in a way that didn't cause the military to bolt from him. I mean, he was, he was relatively uh, successful in keeping them on board despite the fact they didn't agree with him. Uh, made a big difference. You know, David Fromm, who was one of his speechwriters and later a critic, so not a, not a, not a, not a Kool-Aid drinker by any stretch, he says that uh, Bush had two other, his post-9-11 moments obviously were, were dynamic and, 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 and invigorating to some extent, right? The bullhorn moment where we all uh, uh, remember so, so vividly. But the two most courageous and decisive and, and daring decisions he makes as president are the surge in Iraq and the TARP decision at the end of his presidency where he, he, again, goes against all popular opinion and any political instinct, frankly, any politician would have, not to mention his own conservative free market thinking, to do what he is told is necessary to prevent a much greater cataclysm, right? A new Great Depression. He's told by Hank Paulson and Ben Bernanke there's going to be a new Great Depression. And Bush says, well, if, 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 if that's what's going to happen, I'm sure as hell going to be FDR and not Hoover, right? He's willing to to chuck everything aside to do what's necessary to try to save the country. What David Frum then points out is that both those instances of daring, bold decisions come, though, after years of antecedent you know, neglect or failure to see the developing crises, right? So you, you, you get, a, I think, a fuller understanding of how his presidency develops over time uh, by going back and re-examining it. That's a long-winded answer. I don't know if that's any good. <laughs> I was curious to know if Mr. Cheney disagreed with Mr. Bush on the TARP decision you just mentioned, and also uh, if how what sense you had of how much Mr. Bush relied on advice from his father, if at all. Everything I've read seemed to indicate that he hardly ever went to him for advice, and I found that very curious. Yeah, no, that's good. Those are two good questions. Um, Cheney actually agrees with Bush on TARP. Uh, he agrees that the system is is on is on such tender hooks that there's no choice but to 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 use this decisive application of, of federal power in effect uh, to stop the the bleeding. Uh, where he disagrees with Bush at the end on the economic uh, decisions is the auto bailout. Uh, the two split on that. Cheney thinks that as a good conservative free market uh, uh, free market advocate would think, these are companies that made bad decisions. Uh, and they deserve to fail. That's what a, that's what a free market e economy is all about. Uh, Bush, I think, is inclined to agree with that, but thinks that the impact of that happening literally on the door, you know, literally on the eve of a new presidency is just too much to ask his successor to, to, to absorb. It would be, in effect, it would be uh, unfair to Obama, his successor, to l let this collapse right as he's coming into office. So instead, he says, I'm going to bail him out 
through March, and then that gives the new president a chance to decide what he thinks is the right thing to do. Uh, and so that's where they split. Uh, on the father, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. That's, a, that's still something of a black box, I think. Um, I think you're right. I think that, like a lot of sons of successful fathers, there's a desire to prove yourself and, and, and not to have to rely on your father for advice. I think there was a reluctance on Bush 41's part to you know, intervene and, and, and to, to be seen as you know, telling his son what to do. So I think they kind of had a... They, and they had a, you know, both of them clearly love each other a great deal um, and decided to, to, to leave those things off the table for the most part during their presidency. At least that's what, I've, uh, that's what I've heard. But it's, you know, that's a relationship that's hard to understand. There will be, I, I'll, I'm going to pitch a friend who's doing a book on this very subject, Mark uh, Updegrove. He's head of the LBJ Library uh, in Austin. Very good guy. Friendly with both Bushes. And both Bushes have agreed to, and are talking to him for a book about the two bushes, which I think will be fascinating, will come out in 2015. And I, I highly recommend it, even though I haven't seen it yet, because I know you'll do a great job. So. Hi, uh, I was kind of curious, um, sort of discussing what Obama has said and done uh, with Syria and also what he promised to do with Guantanamo and what actually took place when he took office and sort of why you think he's, you know, done and said the things that he's done as president and how that might be connected to Bush's presidency. Right. Well, those are good questions. Very good questions, right? Uh, president Obama did plan or did promise to close Guantanamo, the president of Guantanamo. He thinks it's a, a stain on our national reputation and it's caused us uh, uh, credibility problems around the world. Um, but he's found it much more difficult than he thought. Uh, it's not an easy situation. In fact, President Bush wanted to close Guantanamo toward the end. Uh, he just wasn't able to get there. You know, he, he, he got rid of hundreds of prisoners in Guantanamo, moved them to other countries, or well, the ones who should be released were released, uh, but couldn't get through the final nub of a couple hundred left because, in fact, many of them are the, considered to be the worst of the worst. Obama has whittled that number down a little bit, you know, repatriated some, but couldn't get a lot of them uh, who are still there. About half of them who are still there are from Yemen. Yemen is such a basket case of a country uh, and has gone through such a tumultuous time these last few years. The idea of sending them back to Yemen seems like a bad idea or has seemed like a bad idea. They're trying to work something out now where they can have more guarantees, but has seemed like too dangerous an idea that these guys could be then released and, and back into the, into the fray. So it's been hard. And then Congress has just said no. You know, <laughs> what congressman is going to say, yeah, that's good. I'm going to vote for having these guys come to my district, right? I mean, the truth is our supermax prisons are really very tight. People don't escape from supermax prisons. You know, we have terrorists in our supermax prisons. There's, there's very little evidence that bringing these guys from Guantanamo would be a genuine security risk. But if you're a congressman, why would you take the chance, right? It's certainly not a good symbolism. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, there's a feeling of, you know, so be it. It is what it is, and we'll just we'll live with it as it is. The truth is, if you go to Guantanamo, and I have it, but my colleagues have, you know, it's been made into a pretty normal prison, you know? I mean, they're not waterboarding people there. They're not doing anything to these guys there. They're in a pretty normal prison. So does it matter this, this you know, it matters the matter of reputation more than it matters the matter of practicality, right? Their lives are not that much different in Guantanamo than they would be in, in Norman, Illinois, which is the place they're gonna put them. Um, and I don't think their legal rights at this point change because the Supreme Court has said that uh, we, we, we our, our jurisdiction extends to Guantanamo. On Syria, I think the episode with Syria tells you just how much uh, this country is still grappling with these issues. What is the right role for America in the world? President Obama said he was going to launch a strike on uh, Syria to punish them for the use of chemical weapons. This is similar, right? This is very similar issues that Bush confronted. What do you do about Middle East where these dangerous weapons can kill mass numbers of civilians? 1,400 civilians were, were said to be killed in Syria by chemical weapons. Now, he clearly, though, is so ambivalent about it that he said, instead of just simply doing it, which is what most presidents would do in that circumstance, he, he starts thinking about it out loud and talking about it. I'm not really, you know, we don't want, none of us want to do it. And he said, oh, I'm going to ask Congress to do it. And Congress would say, whoa, we don't want to do that. You know, there's a, such a weariness now about getting entangled in Middle East wars, even dropping some bombs, which, not putting boots on the ground, but even dropping bombs just seems very, um, 
just, you know, it just turns people off these days. There's such a hangover from Iraq and, and Afghanistan uh, that uh, there's very little public appetite to do it. And he was kind of rescued. He handled it so ambivalently that I think it hurt his political reputation because it looked like he uh, didn't know what he was doing. And, he, and, and if Congress had actually voted against it, it would have been a devastating defeat. Probably the, the worst congressional rejection on a, on a war and peace issue of a president since uh, you know, Wilson and the League of Nations and the Treaty of Versailles back in 19, uh, 1920. So um, Russia, Russia, ironically, came to his rescue by coming up with this deal, and Obama says, yeah, let's do that. And, you know, I'm skeptical about Russia having lived there for four years, but for the moment it seems to be uh, uh, working, and we'll see what happens, uh, whether it sticks that way. I wonder if you could comment a bit more about President Bush's economic thoughts before the meltdown. You spoke about TARP and you spoke about the auto bailout going against his basic philosophy. And I have a bit of a context on this, that some years ago Margaret Thatcher came here. She was here frequently, of course, and I, to receive an SMU honor. And I was in the audience, and if I remember rightly, she said from the stage that nothing could go wrong with the economy ever again. Hmm. Uh, at that point, I thought, well, I understand why your own party fired you, <laughs> but <laughs> and thinking basically this is nonsense. Now, what sort of thinking did President Bush have before it all tanked? Yeah, no, that's a good question. You know, <sighs> President Bush wanted his second term to be about something he called the opportunity, so uh, the ownership society. And the ownership society involved uh, finding ways to empower people uh, in various ways, uh, ownership through... Uh, he meant by that uh, through these medical savings accounts or through, in this case, home ownership, right? So he was very involved in promoting home ownership, and it was a bipartisan cause. I mean, that's something that everybody believed in. Yes, we want more people in their homes. You know, our neighborhoods are better, you know, with houses that are owned by the people who, who live there. Um, and clearly, you know, the industry had great incentives to, to do that as well, and they failed to understand, failed to anticipate, even though some people did warn them, uh, how dangerous that was becoming with some of these subprime and 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 uh, you know un 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 uh, capitalized uh, uh, mortgages. Now I'm not an economics expert, but I think that I think he was taken aback by it. I think he just and and I, he wasn't the only one, but I just think he just uh, he didn't foresee what was coming. Josh Bolton comes in as chief of staff in 19, in 2006, and he eases John Snow out and brings Hank Paulson in because he sees. A crisis coming, and he believes it's going to be a crisis because just in the average order of things, we have an economic crisis every you know x number of years, and he thought they were kind of due for one. He didn't know what it would be. He didn't see housing as being the cause, but if they were going to have one, he wanted somebody like Hank Paulson around. Hank Paulson comes in, and he he sees something as well, but it's not housing. He's he's worried about other things that turn out not to be the major issue. Now, what Bush will tell you is he did try to do something by uh, reforming F Freddie Mac uh, and. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and the Democrats in Congress, and even Republicans in Congress, wouldn't let him because it's kind of a real political uh, uh, hot button there. And that, there's some truth to that. I mean, that's true that he did try, and it's true that Congress re resisted that. Uh, I'm not smart enough to know whether that by itself would have been enough to have stopped uh, what ends up happening. Um, but he's, you know, he's caught in a situation where uh, um, every day in the, in the summer and fall of, of 2008, they're walking into his office telling him somebody else is about to collapse and you need to do something about it. There's really this moment where they tell him, okay, now we've just let uh, uh, Lehman go, but we're going to have to put $185 billion, or $85 billion into AIG. And he's like, well, what are you talking about? And they say, well, AIG is an insurance company. Well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, they are connected to all the banks. You know, they, they are intertangled with them. And if they go down, everything goes down. And he says to them, someday you're going to have to explain to me how we let this happen. I mean, I think... He just, you know, felt blindsided to some extent by this. What role did Cheney play in advising Bush about picking nominees for the Supreme Court? Great question. Um, very good question. Um, Cheney, Bush puts Cheney in charge of this process from the very beginning. In the spring of 2001, Cheney sets up a task force at the president's direction 
to review possible candidates for the Supreme Court if and when there might be uh, an opening. And they pulled together binders, uh, binders of, uh, uh, <laughs> binders of men and women, and. Uh, <laughs> Um, candidates that they could possibly have and have them ready to, to go. Alberto Gonzalez, who's the White House counsel, even goes and interviews a few possible candidates. And then every spring, they would kind of refresh the literature, the literature and research in case the end of term in June brought a retirement. Never did. 2005 comes along, second term, uh, and it's clear that Chief Justice uh, Rehnquist is failing. He's got thyroid cancer, and he's doing pretty badly. So this spring, they really take it on very seriously. At this point, Cheney actually wants to interview candidates himself, uh, before there's an opening, he, he uh, brings them to the vice president's mansion. Uh, John Roberts comes, Sam Alito comes, uh, th uh, several other judges come, Michael Ludig and so forth. Uh, so when the word comes that uh, Justice O'Connor is stepping down, they're ready to go. President Bush has given 11 uh, files of, of candidates, and he, uh, and he takes them off to Europe and he studies them. Now, he ends up going with John Roberts, who was one of the candidates. Cheney actually preferred... Uh, uh, Michael Ludig, who was a judge on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Ludig was a friend and protege of, 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 of Scalia, more full-throated conservative. Roberts was sort of unknown. Uh, he was believed to be conservative, but he was a smoother fellow. He was less uh, overt, and, and, and uh, uh, he hadn't been on the bench for very long, didn't have enough opinions for them to really judge uh, the way they wanted to. But the president liked him a lot, so he, he, took, he didn't take Cheney's first choice. Then comes, of course, the next position, Chief Justice Rehnquist passes away, and they decide Roberts is doing so well, they're going to elevate him to that slot. So they, once again, they're looking at Sandra Day O'Connor's uh, seat. And this time he picks Harriet Myers. Harriet Myers is not on Cheney's list, not on anybody's list, frankly, other than President Bush's. President Bush knows Harriet Myers. He really adores her, respects the world out of her. He knows her heart, as he would say. And like he had done repeatedly through his presidency, he turns the inner circle. He really relies on his inner circle. And he believes that his judgment about Harriet Myers ought to be respected by, by others. And he's told by people that this would be an easy confirmation, right? She's not seen as a, as a flamethrower. Harry Reid even said, the Democratic leader said, I like her, she's good. If you, start, if you go with her, I guarantee that you'll be starting with 56 votes, meaning the 55 Republicans in him. So Bush has just had Katrina, in which he suffered politically. Iraq is going badly. So he thinks Harriet Myers is going to be an easy confirmation. Now, that's a misjudgment, right? And Janie tells him that. Cheney says, it's going to be a hard one. I don't think this is a good idea. Bush comes and says, I think I'm going to make a choice. I don't think you're going to like. He says, well, it's going to be a tough one. So obviously, it becomes tough. Now, the Myers nomination blows up not just because of the conservative reaction to it, although that certainly doesn't help. What actually happens is uh, that the lawyers go to prep her for uh, her confirmation hearings. And they discover she doesn't really know much about this stuff. She'd been a corporate lawyer. She didn't do constitutional law, so they ask her about Fourth Amendment, uh, uh, you know, reasonable search, uh, reasonable, reasonable suspicion versus probable cause for searches, and she didn't really understand the differences, and she didn't really know much about the Fifth Amendment self-incrimination rules, all these very specific things that we now want our Supreme Court nominees to know off the top of their head. We used to have Supreme Court nominees, by the way, who weren't lawyers, who were politicians, or who had never served as a judge. Today, with the exception of Elena Kagan, every Supreme Court justice was an appeals court judge before. We've completely changed the way we think of the Supreme Court. And, and that's what Bush was thinking about with Myers. He would pick somebody who wasn't part of the, the ivory tower of the, of the appellate court. Well, the lawyers come to him and say, it's going to be a disaster. If you let her go before the Senate, when she knows so little about these issues, they're going to crucify her. It would be unfair to her. So he ends up, of course, she ends up dropping out. Cheney says to an aide, I tried to tell him. Comes back, he's got one more uh, slot at it. He picks Sam Alito. Again, uh, uh, Cheney would have preferred uh, Ludig, but, but he's okay with Alito. So it's, it's interesting. I mean, you know, it, it, I think uh, encapsulates the whole dynamic of the relationship, right? Bush entrusts Cheney with a major, major part of his, of his presidency, right? The selection of Supreme Court justice, even though he's not a lawyer. Cheney does a lot of work on it and everything. But in the end, Bush does exercise his own judgment for better or for worse. What do you think about the um, major media reporting of politics today and how deeply divided um, the major media outlets are in reporting on the presidency and on politics in general? Yeah. No, that's a good question. Um, you know, more and more we obviously turn to, to, to news organizations that we think reflect 
what we we tend to you know uh, believe we MSNBC Fox you know Huffington Post Daily Caller um, you know I I still think and believe strongly that we need media that doesn't take sides. I mean, it's, I think it's great that we have all these new outlets. I do. I think they add to the marketplace of ideas. But I really hope that it's important that there's still places in the, in the, in the, in the country for, for newspapers and news organizations that at least try to be balanced, neutral, objective. There is no such thing as unbiased. I know that. There's no such thing as objective. It's sort of like, but I look at it kind of like, uh, like religion, right? We all want to live a sin-free life. We at least aspire to live a sin-free life, even if we all are sinners, right? There's no such thing as completely objective, but we reporters ought to at least seek to be that as much as we can. Uh, so, I, you know, I think, I think we try very hard to do that. Um, do we succeed at, 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 all the time? Of course not. Um, President Bush chose not to be interviewed for this book because he didn't think the New York Times uh, reporter could be fair. All right? You know, I, I, I respect that. I, I tried to convince him otherwise. I kept showing up at his events hoping to convince him. He finally looks at me and says, Baker, are you stalking me? I said, yes, sir, I'm waiting for my interview. <laughs> uh, but, you know, um, I was sorry I couldn't convince him, but um, in the end I did convince, you know, most everybody else uh, who, uh, who worked for him, uh, Vice President Cheney, Condi Rice, Don Rumsfeld, uh, Colin Powell, David Petraeus, uh, uh, Bartlett, Hughes, Gerson, uh, uh, Hadley, so forth. And I think actually... Uh, yeah, I'm going to say this here in Dallas. I'm probably in trouble here. I think the president kind of softened a little bit on the project because I think some of these people would not have talked to me ultimately had he not, you know, allowed them to. Some of them, it took 24 to 30 months to get them to talk to me, right? Um, my, the one guy who lasted the longest took 30 months to get. And, uh, I, you know, two and a half years. And we finally got up from the interview and he, he did sit down with me. And I said, well, thank you for doing it. I know you were reluctant to do it. He says, well, I thought we weren't supposed to. <laughs> Uh, and he sent me a message the other day saying he thinks the book is fair. So I think that, you know, I think it's important that we have media that tries at least to be uh, fair and balanced, to use a phrase, um, recognizing that, uh, that that's uh, it's a very polarized time and the media reflects the polarized uh, country we live in. Uh oh. Uh, I do not intend to be fair and balanced. Good. Uh, all right. I bring, want to go back bring, actually bring to, it on, yeah. as somebody I know around here <laughs> would say. Uh, after we're done, I'll say mission accomplished. <laughs> um, I want to go back to the Bush-Cheney relationship and sort of you've made a really compelling argument about the nature of their relationship and the power within their relationship. But let me ask you to take a look at the entire administration and essentially ask the null hypothesis question, which is how does Bush's White House years look differently? How do those eight years look differently if Cheney is not chosen as the vice president? I mean, ultimately, what is his influence? And can we see that if it had been someone else, McCain, Dole, someone else? Yeah, and that's a great question. I get, this, I, I get asked this a lot by the St. Louis media, ironically, because Jack Danforth was the, the runner-up, in effect. And um, I got asked this today by a St. Louis radio station, so it's funny. Uh, I think Jack Danforth would have been a different vice president than Cheney. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that's a good question. I think that Cheney clearly, uh, while not, manipulating Bush into doing things he wasn't going to do encourages instincts that Bush might have had otherwise, and it's possible a different vice president might have helped uh, steer him in a different direction on some of these things, might have raised red flags about things that became uh, troublesome later, or, uh, um, but I, you know, some people say, well, he wouldn't have gone into Iraq otherwise. I don't think that's true. I, I, think, I, think, Bush, I think Bush came to that conclusion, you know, very clearly on his own um, for the, all the reasons that he has said, you know, and some of them he hasn't. Um, and I don't think Cheney was the one who got him to do it. I think Cheney encouraged him to do it. There was a moment when they're having lunch. Cheney's impatient, actually, that Bush isn't doing more. He says, are you going to take care of this guy or not? Right, meaning Saddam Hussein. So he definitely is egging him on. Um, but I, I think they were, I think they were, I think they were together on that. I do. And I think that uh, uh, Bush saw the world um, uh, as a dangerous place and that Saddam Hussein, you know, needed to be taken out if uh, we were going to try to protect the country. So uh, would have been different, I think, you know, clearly, but the what ifs are hard to, hard to play out. We see, you know, we see the second term. I mean, you know, uh, you, you could sort of play one against the other, I suppose. But uh, I think you had to get maybe the first term to get to the second term. Condi Rice says, she told me this in an interview, she says, we broke a lot of China and she doesn't mean the country, she means the metaphorical 
dishware uh, in the, in the, in the, right after 9-11. And by the second term, we had to re begin rebuilding relations and alliances and, and, and so forth uh, to leave something behind. And she says the vice president would have liked to continue breaking China. And her view is that um, they did some of the things they did right after 9-11 uh, that look controversial uh, because the country had no defenses at that point, didn't know what to do following 9-11, and they made a conscious decision, we're going to do what we think it requires, even at the cost of having to explain ourselves later, you know, on things like interrogations, torture, detention, and ultimately Iraq. Um, they were broke China. Um, and they felt that they did it because they had to, and that they were willing to pay a price later, and I think they did pay a price later. So... Well, Rumsfeld and Cheney are very good friends, obviously. They, they go back 30 years. Uh, Rumsfeld gives Cheney, the question is about Rumsfeld, sorry. Uh, Rumsfeld gives Cheney his first White House job in the Nixon White House. Uh, they're close personal friends. Their families had vacationed together. They own houses next to each other in Southern Maryland. So they are a tight tandem, and they're a powerful force, no question. They outmaneuver Condi Rice and Colin Powell in a lot of these uh, early debates. Um, and, I, and obviously, Cheney's friendship with Rumsfeld helps preserve Rumsfeld's job longer than it might have otherwise uh, been. People around Bush were urging him as early as 2004, including relatives as well as advisors, to replace Rumsfeld. Uh, fairly or unfairly, he was already controversial for what was happening in Iraq. And uh, Cheney says, no, it's a dangerous thing to change a defense secretary in the middle of a war. Uh, and Bush thinks that, uh, he, Bush decides not to because he's, he feels loyal to people under him and he thinks that getting rid of Rumsfeld doesn't change anything because Rumsfeld's putting in place the policy that he, the president, had agreed to and that Rumsfeld was just taking arrows for him. Changed his mind, obviously, two years later. And it's a sign of how things had changed that two years later when he does decide to replace Rumsfeld, he doesn't tell Cheney until he's already made the decision. I asked Cheney about that. I said, well, what did he, did he ask you about what to do? He says, no. By the time it came to me, it was already done. And that tells you how much things had changed by that point. I also think that Rumsfeld's presence there inhibited Cheney on thinking about a new way in Iraq earlier. He, uh, in his memoir, he says some people at the Pentagon uh, were too enamored of the strategy of training the Iraqis and getting out, which is essentially the Rumsfeld, uh, George Casey strategy. He even uses the phrase that Rumsfeld often used, which is we need to take our hand off the bicycle you know, let them bike on their own, in effect. But, but Cheney, in, in disparaging this thinking, doesn't identify it as Rumsfeld. That's his friend. He can't do it. So I think that while Cheney believed in earlier 2006 that maybe it's time to think about a surge or something like that, he was inhibited from actually advocating that because he didn't want to go against his friend. And it's only after Rumsfeld is gone that Cheney becomes kind of an advocate for the surge. The surge actually is really Bush's baby uh, and his staff around and the Steve Hadley and those guys. So um, obviously a critical critical person in a critical role. Well, I think this has just been great. Um, and I think it, it, it's, uh, among other things, it's It's a great book, and it's also a great indication, as you said, that even the New York Times can be fair and balanced. And I want to <laughs> tell one anecdote about that, if I could. <clears throat> From President Bush 41, I was with 41s in his office at one point when uh, he walked in in sort of a rage and was screaming at the top of his lungs, that's it, I'm tired of it, I'm not going to read this liberal rag anymore, cancel my subscription to the Times, cancel it now, cancel it now. And he walked out, and his chief of staff looked at me and said, yeah, he does that about four times a week. <laughs> uh, and he expects it on top of his stack the next morning. So, uh, so we certainly are very glad that you were here. And again, join me one more time in thanking Peter. Thank you.